I have read a lot of personal finance books. And if I have to recommend one that you must read, it has to be this one. This book, The Psychology of Money, explores how we think and behave around money. And in this video, I'll share 12 lessons, scratch that, 13 lessons that I learned from this book. So let's jump right into it. Lesson one, confessions. The first and the best advice comes from the last chapter of the book titled My Confessions. In this chapter, Morgan brilliantly concluded the book with how he handles his own money. And the lesson here is to always watch out for what people do, not just what they say. The truth is there are people who would say one thing and then do another. And I believe that this is the trap of content creation. But if there is a difference between what someone says you should do and what they do for themselves, it doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. It just shows that when trying to solve a problem for you and your family, there is one answer and then there is the universal truth. Lesson two, we have different attitudes towards money or you could say no one's crazy. What makes us all unique is the fact that we are all a unique blend of our experiences, family, values, where we were born, how we grew up, the opportunities we had, so on and so forth. And as a result, we all have different attitudes towards money, which in turn influences our financial decisions and outcomes. Imagine two people. The first grew up in a war-torn country where he experienced destruction firsthand, and the second didn't experience any of that growing up. For example, maybe the person lived in Cornwall, England. This place. It would be crazy to expect both of them to have the same worldview about money. And while their individual experiences make up for 0.0000001% of the world experience, it makes up about 80% of how they think the world works. There is a quote in the book that captures this point perfectly. And that quote says that every financial decision a person makes makes sense to them at the moment they are making that decision and also that decision checks all the box they need to check the truth is even though our individual experiences don't matter when compared to the world's total experience in our own world it means everything therefore to make better financial decisions we must understand our own experiences and how they shape our attitude thoughts and habits towards money. The third lesson is the role of luck in financial success. The truth is success or failure isn't just as a result of our skills or lack of them, but instead it's a combination of skills and luck. Luck can come in many forms. For example, your good luck factor could be an inheritance or even something as simple as being born in a financially stable family or a developed country like the US or the UK. Warren Buffett, the greatest investor of our time, is quoted to say that he simply had the good luck of winning the ovarian lottery to be born in America. Morgan Hansel shares the story of Bill Gates as an example of both good luck and bad luck. According to the book, Bill Gates had one in a million luck to attend Lakeside School. At the time, it was one of the few high schools to have a computer. This was also where he met his partner, Paul Allen, and that's good luck. But he had a third friend, Kent Evans, who would have been the third partner of Microsoft, but he died in a mountaineering accident before he graduated from high school. What are the odds of Bill Gates attending Lakeside School? And also, what are the odds of Kent Evans dying from a mountaineering accident? For Kent Evans, it's one in a million. Bill Gates was even quoted to say if there was no Lakeside School, there would have been no Microsoft. It's important to keep luck in mind, especially when judging ourselves and others. So instead of focusing on individual successes or failures, what did Bill Gates do to get rich? What did Jeff Bezos do to get rich? Which can be dangerous. 
focus instead on broad patterns across many individuals because that's how we can find reliable and actionable takeaways. Lesson four, contentment and enough. Specifically, knowing what is enough. Morgan Hansel says that the hardest financial skill to learn is getting the goalpost to stop moving, learning to be content, learning to say this is enough. I know for a fact that it will be enough when I hit a million subscribers. So don't forget to hit the subscribe button and help the channel get to 1 million subs. Morgan shared two examples in this book to drive this point home. Rajat Gupta and Benny Madoff. These two men were both rich and successful, but they did terrible things for more money. The question we should all ask ourselves is, how much is enough? That's why I love the FIRE Financial Independence Retire Early community because they have put a number to this question based on simple math and they call this the FIRE number. That is enough. That is the goalpost. Lesson 5, the power of compounding or compound interest. Before we go in, first, what is compound interest? Imagine earning interest on your investments and then earning an interest on that interest and so on and so on and so on. According to Raval Navikant, compounding can be applied not just to your finances but also to your relationships, to your career, to your business. Anything can compound. So think of how you can apply compounding to different areas of your life. A classic example of compounding in action is the billionaire investor Warren Buffett. He started investing at the age of 11. At age 30, he had a net worth of $1 million or $9.3 million if you adjust for inflation today. And today, he's currently worth over $100 billion. But what many fail to realize is that 97 billion of that money came after his 65th birthday. No wonder Morgan says compound interest is the most powerful force in the universe for those who understand it and use it to their advantage. Lesson six, don't lose money. So if compounding helps you become wealthy, this lesson helps you keep it. It's easy to think that it's the same skill that helps you make money, that would help you keep money. But while there are a lot of materials out there to help you make money, there are very few materials that focuses on keeping money. To make money, you have to take risk. To, but to keep money, you have to be fearful and humble. To be fearful and humble, you have to think longevity long-term actions and you have to plan for your plan not working if that makes sense good investing is not about making the right investments or making big returns it's simply about not screwing up lesson seven the importance of saving what many people fail to realize is that building wealth has little to do with your income but lots to do with your savings rates your savings rate is the difference between your income and your lifestyle, or as Morgan puts it, your ego. Your ego can often lead to spending more than you can afford in an effort to keep up with others or to maintain a certain image. Spend less than you earn and invest the difference. That's the simple formula to building wealth, and many people find this very hard to do, even though this gives our future self more flexibility and freedom. Lesson eight, dividends of money. According to Morgan, freedom is the best thing you can buy with money. The ability to wake up every day and say, I can do whatever I want, when I want, with whomever I want, for as long as I want. Using money to buy time and options have a lifestyle benefit that few luxury goods can compete with. Tons of studies have shown that there is a certain point where more money really don't buy you any more happiness. In contrast to freedom, which is the highest dividends of money, 
the lowest dividend of money is luxury stuff. Because what people really want isn't the luxury stuff itself, but what they want to feel when they have that luxury stuff. For example, they want to be liked or they want to be respected. Lesson 9. You will change. For many of us, the present us is very different from what we envisaged 5, 10, 15 years ago. And this shows that we are such poor forecasters of our future selves. The main reason for this is because we grossly underestimate how much our personality, desires, and goals will change in the future. Do you remember what you wanted to become as a teenager? For most of us, this has changed many times over the years. So how do we handle this going forward when making long-term decisions? Stay away from extremes. It's as simple as that. Be okay with the fact that you will change your mind in the future. Lesson 10. The appeal of pessimism. Before we talk about pessimism, what is optimism? Optimism is the belief that the odds of a good outcome are in your favor over time. Even if there are setbacks along the way. That's a good thing, right? So why do we pay more attention to pessimism, especially in finance? Maybe because it's more common. Or maybe because it sounds smarter or more convincing. But whatever the case, you need to know that we as humans are wired to pay more attention to pessimism. And as a result, pessimism sells. Just have a look at YouTube. But the fact is, even if things are bad today, they will get better. Just look at all the world events that have happened in the history of the stock market. It's still going up. Even though there might have been occasional dips, the future won't be as gloomy as people say it will be. The sky is not falling. Lesson 11. Leave room for error. The reality for many of our plans is that it won't go according to plan. Your home renovation projects will go over budget and schedule. That road trip you're planning might get delayed, so it's wise to always leave room for error. And also in your investment strategy, having a cash buffer and not investing all the money you have in the stock market means leaving room for error. Bill Gates in his early days said something about leaving room for error that I think we can all learn from. In Microsoft's early days, he said he always had one year's worth of cash to pay salaries in the bank. That is leaving room for error. Think about it. If your future investment return for retirement is a third of what the historical average is, can you handle it? Would you be able to retire according to your plans? Leaving room for error might mean reducing the expected returns when planning, which also means that you save more each month if you want to reach your expected goal. Leaving room for error is simply acknowledging that things may not go according to plan. Lesson 12. Nothing is free. There is a prize for everything, but not all prizes appear in labels and tags. And that's the problem because that means that prizes of a lot of things are not obvious until you have experienced them firsthand. For example, investing in the stock market has a hidden price. For you, if you want to invest in the S&P 500 for the long term with an average return of, say, 7%, which it has been historically, there is a hidden price to pay, which is the stock market volatility. Many people don't consider this price and that's why they sell their investments when the market is down, therefore making their loss a reality. For the stock market and investing for the long haul, think of the volatility as a fee rather than a fine. And tell yourself, I won't avoid the fee, so I don't end up paying double. Lesson 13. Be reasonable rather than rational. You are not a robot. Oh, really? Even 3PO could be reasonable. Goodness gracious me. You can't keep making financial decisions based on logical reasoning. It will wear you out. There is longevity 
when you are reasonable and practical in your decision makings. You can't live on a spreadsheet. Decisions are made on the dinner table. There is always a human element that will not make sense to your spreadsheet. Remember the first lesson I shared. Always ask yourself, will I be able to sleep at night? If overpaying your mortgage, for example, will make you sleep at night, then go for it. In conclusion, The Psychology of Money is a thought-provoking and insightful read that provides valuable insight for anyone interested in improving their financial literacy and decision-making skills. I hope you've enjoyed this summary. Write in the comments which lesson stood out for you.